that E prime is in V of Boole. OK? But now we know that true steps to some E prime, but true is a value already. So E prime must be, must be true itself, right? Therefore, what we all we need to show is E prime is, since E prime is true, um, we just need to show that true belongs to V of Boole, which is immediate from the definition of the value interpretation of Boole, right? OK. So just wanted to unwind the definitions to, to show you how, how that goes. Um, OK. Now, thinking, should we do, would you guys like to do the lambda case? How many people did the, uh, did the proof of strong normalization last night, the lambda case? Didn't get that one. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right, maybe we should do this then. But you guys, come on, wake up, help me out. I don't like this. This, is, this room is way too quiet, way quieter than last year. <laughs> Benjamin is smiling. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, Let's do lambda. <laughs> that might. <laughs> somewhere in the middle last year, too. <laughs> People are tired. Too much clock hacking. OK, um, here we go. Lambda x colon tau dot e. Uh, maybe we just had a better group last year. We just wanted. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. We hadn't, what? <laughs> I missed it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. Um. OK, so we're going to prove this theorem here. By the way, let's, uh, let's just step back for a second. Or let me just erase this. before we wade any further into proofs. Um, this theorem, right, which says that if, if E is well typed, then E semantically behaves like it has type tau. Um, I, I keep using this, this terminology, semantically behaves like it has type tau, because we're doing a proof of type safety. All right? But when you do anything with logical relations, you're going to see a theorem of this form every single time. OK? And the general form is, if E is well typed, then it's in the logical relation. What, what we've done over here is we've built a logical relation. We first explained when uh, closed values and closed expressions belonged to you know, the value and expression interpretations. And then we explained when open terms were in the logical relation. That's what that notation is, all right? In, in, in if you read it in its most general form. Um, so what, what this is saying, this theorem, is saying that if something is well typed, then it belongs to the logical relation. This, is, this theorem is known as the fundamental property. It's called the fundamental property of logical relations. It's also called the basic lemma. So in papers that you read, you will see it called either one or the other of these. Um, Okay, so whenever you, whenever you do this sort of thing, you set up a logical relation, you always then have to go and prove uh, a fundamental property, which basically tells you something about your logical relation being sort of internally c consistent in some way. Okay? And you'll start to see what I mean by that a little bit more when we get to those binary logical relations. Okay? Uh, all right, so this is the fundamental property that we're proving. Uh, all right, so um, we're proving it by induction on the derivation of that, and we are going to consider the lambda case. All right, so what do we have to show? We have to show that lambda x colon tau 1 dot e semantically behaves like it has type tau 1 or tau 2. Okay, uh, let's look at the definition. All right, we say suppose we are given a substitution, little gamma, right? So suppose gamma belongs to G gamma. We are required, since we're trying to show this, we're required to show that gamma applied to our expression behaves like it has the appropriate type. So we have to show that gamma of lambda x colon tau 1 dot E belongs to E of our type tau 1 arrow tau 2. OK? All right. Someone tell me what to do next. 
trivial step. So we can simplify that substitution? We can simplify the substitution. Let's push the substitution in. Showing this is equivalent to showing lambda x colon tau 1 dot gamma e belongs to e of tau 1 arrow tau 2. Okay. Um, all right. So let's go see what we need to do in order to prove this. Let's look at the definition of e tau. Uh, well, we again, we have to say that uh, suppose that our expression steps to some e prime. Right, so suppose that this lambda, I'm really spelling it out, um, steps to some e prime in some number of steps, and e prime is irreducible. And now we have to show that the e prime that we have belongs to v of tau 1 <laughs> arrow tau 2. This is very much like the true case, right? OK, so now we already have a value. So it, that must mean that e prime is, in fact, the lambda term that we had, right? So showing this just amounts to showing that this lambda that we have, lambda x dot gamma e, belongs to v of tau 1 over tau 2. OK? So how do we show that? What do we need to do to show that? Let's look at the definition of v tau 1 over tau 2. Um, what does it say? It says that you get to have a value v in v of tau 1. All right? So suppose we are given a value in v of tau 1. Um, we have to show that after beta reduction, when we have gamma e with v for x, right? Take the body of this lambda, that's what it says, and substitute v for x. Uh, we have to show that that belongs to e of tau 2. Now what? Hmm, substitution lemma. Um, by the way, we have. We haven't used an induction hypothesis yet, have we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> since I'm pointing at it. Okay. So since we know that um, E is well typed, it has type two, uh, type tau two under this environment, under the extended environment. We know by the induction hypothesis that under gamma x colon tau one, semantically. E behaves like it has type tau 2. Right? We get that from the induction hypothesis here. And this is a double term style. All right. So let's try to use that fact. Yes? Can we do substitution by extending gamma with e for x? OK, so we have gamma, right? And we know that it's in g of gamma. And this v that belongs to v of tau 1. So gamma extended with x maps to v1, what we want is to show that that satisfies the extended environment, gamma with x colon tau 1. And in order to show that, what do we need to do? Well, we just need to observe that the gamma alone satisfies, belongs to g of gamma, and the v1 alone <coughs> belongs to v of tau 1. We have both of those facts here and here, right? And that's all we need, looking at the definition of g of gamma. OK, so we have this fact. So we instantiate this with this gamma. And note that we, have, we know that it belongs to g of ga uh, the extended environment. Um, therefore, we can immediately conclude that if we take this substitution, gamma with x maps to v1, and apply it to this expression, uh, that that belongs to E of this type, tau 2. Sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for any V1 and tau 1. It's just, you're right, the V over there. OK? OK. So we have this fact. Um, and this is what we wanted to show. 
which is exactly, yes, precisely. So th this expression is just equivalent to that, right? So we could just do gamma E and then substitute V for X. So we're done. Yes? Um, we're uh, that induction over the types, right? We're doing, uh, wait, for the... Over Okay, so it's the so tau two having okay, so it's the derivation for uh, okay. tau two is being smaller type and therefore a sub derivation. That's why we get to use that induction hypothesis. I'm just um yes exactly. So yeah. uh, we have a, a type of derivation that ends with this, right? So the type of derivation that ends with this is a smaller derivation. Yeah. Therefore, we can apply the induction to conclude this, right? Okay. But, but the don't, don't get, uh, in the they they don't no they don't have to. Well, it depends on the calculus. But we'll we're not doing induction on the types right now. The the bit where induction on types comes in. Let's go back and take stare at this for a second. This logical relation is defined by induction on the structure of types. Okay. Let's look at why this is well-founded. Um, here we define bool. We're defining v of bool. That's pretty easy. That's our base case, right? It doesn't use v of bool or v of anything or e of anything, right? OK. Um, the definition for at function types is well-founded because it appeals to v of tau 1. But tau 1 is a smaller type than tau 1 r tau 2. So we're good there. Um, and here it appeals to e of tau 2. Hmm. It doesn't appeal to V of tau 2, so we're not quite sure yet. So let's go look at E of tau 2. Um, if this was E of tau 2, then it means, then that means that it appeals to V of tau 2. But V of tau 2 is smaller than V of tau 1 R, right? Smaller, tau 2 is smaller than tau 1 R tau 2. So it's well-founded. Yes? So I guess to help coming up, when we go to recursive types, is it which part of this breaks down. Is it just well-founded as you just described, or is it the induction on the derivation? Uh, it is the definition itself. Okay. It will be in the definition of uh, recursive types. Yes? Uh, there's something stopping us from defining V and E and D as uh, inductive version of rule, with rules. Uh, with rules? Uh, you mean, yeah, sure. <coughs> That's absolutely fine. Yes. That's just a stylistic way of, uh, you know, however you want to write. Absolutely. Well, it's a bit more simple. If you try to define this with, as an inductive definition with rules in Cork, it will fail because there is a non negative, a non certain positive occurrence there. Yes, right. Yes. So <coughs> you really have to define it as uh, by using by social um, recursion over the types in a system like Cork. Yes, and for that I'm going to refer you to, um, there's a chapter on, on uh, normalization for simply type dynamic calculus in, in software foundations. Chapter that I'm full back Okay, and he goes through um, all the details of how you perform like, from normalization from yesterday. And the same idea applies to all of the logical relations that you have to Okay. Um, So we've done the lambda case. This is actually the shorter case. Uh, the application case is a little bit longer. Um, uh, so homework for tonight, <laughs> okay? Uh, try it out at least, just so because you can't really understand logical relations properly unless you at least step through one or two proofs, proofs of at least a couple of cases. Okay. Yes. Um, yesterday I was talking specifically in the context of uh, you know. Lambda and application. I, I wouldn't say that, say that um, in general. Yeah. Um, and here, it's not that application is harder. Application is just longer, the proof, because you have two subterms, E1 and E2, and they're both going to need to get reduced to values, and just the way the, the definitions unfold, it becomes a longer proof. Right? Because ultimately, you're trying to show that E1 applied to E2 belongs to the E relation, which says that, you know, the application gets all the way to some value, so you have to look at a bunch of sub-expressions. Apply induction hypotheses twice. Yes? What makes something a logical 
It all seems like uh, a more explicit way of doing a big induction loading. Okay. So it's just making induction loading explicit. That's the logical way. Induction loading? Uh, yeah, that you make. Um, <coughs> the things you're doing here is you're making your induction hypothesis stronger. Yes, exactly. Precisely the point I was sort of emphasizing again and again yesterday that this is giving you a way to strengthen your induction hypothesis. Sort of a recipe, if you say. And in, in fact, the recipe to do so in the case of function types will be pretty much exactly the same every single time. Okay? Even when you add other features, you will just be carrying around the other stuff. The lambda case will look very much like this. If you give me arguments that behave like you have the argument type, then after you do beta reduction, that's what you will behave like you have the actual result type. Okay? All right. Um, let's talk about come back to that. Okay, so what I want to do next is talk about recursive types. Um, or actually, before we do recursive types, let's, let's extend this. Um, suppose that we added pairs to our simply typed lambda calculus. Okay? We're going to add pairs. Um, we're going to add expressions of the form first E, second E for projections. Uh, of course, we'll have pairs E1, E2. The value forms will add V1, V2, and all the appropriate typing rules that you expect. All right? And again, small step uh, evaluation semantics. Um, so I want to write down, uh, I want to extend my logical relation with pairs now. So when do values belong to the type tau1 cross tau2? When you have a pair of values, okay. V1 belongs to V tau1 and second, V of tau2. It's a pretty simple extension. Nothing else changes, right? We've sort of mo modularly, we've, we've separated out uh, the case for expressions and so on. None of that is affected. So a pair of values belongs to the type behaves like it has type tau1 cross tau2 if v1 behaves like it has type tau1 and v2 behaves like it has type tau2. How about sums? Tag sums. So let's say we add in left, in right, in left e, in. Ah, that's the point I was trying to make. Um, so let's ignore sums for a second. We haven't done e of tau1 cross tau2. We don't have to, right? Because we generically defined the E relation for any arbitrary type. So we don't need to go and, and extend that in any way. That still holds. Yeah? Okay. Um, for the pair extension, not at all. Um, there are certain places where, if, uh, of course, once we add something like, oh, in fact, when you add recursive types, the E relation will change because the whole model, the whole logical relation changes. It needs to get richer. Another time the whole logical relation changes is when you add mutable references. Okay, the whole logical relation, the structure uh, sort of changes because you need to track more information essentially. Is that because of the variance in the structure? Um, yeah, yeah, it has to, exactly, but it has to do with the circularities that crop up, right? Like when you have references, you can do cycles in memory and things are basically no longer well founded. But we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, um, so how about sums? Now we have in left, in right, and case. Okay, uh, value forms in left v, v, in right v. When does a value belong to a sum type? Behave like it has a type tau1 pl uh, plus tau2. 
There are two cases. Okay. Why are there two cases? There are there are two different possibilities of what value you can have, right? So a, a value can have this type if it's, let me write it here, if it's in left of V, that's right, V1, right? Or if it's in right of V2. Okay, so when does in left of V1 behave like it has type tau1 plus tau2? And then we just need to union that with in right v2. Right? So it's quite straightforward. Yes. Um, would it work uh, v of t1 by e of t1? Uh, v of t1 by e of t1? Um, So in that sense, it's correct, but why would you do that? I think it'll just complicate your life in the proofs or something. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Or maybe essentially an implication, right? That's the style in which I wrote it. I put a dot there, but there's an implication there, right? If, you're give, if you give me a V1 of tau, type tau1, then I get something of type tau2, right? OK. Um, we're doing a model construction, exactly. We're just interpreting types as sets, OK? Uh, all right, so now let's add recursive types. So how many people here are familiar with Recursive types and fold and unfold. Yeah. Iso recursive from Tapple. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I should ask how many or not because I just want to know if I should spend five minutes. Okay, I'll spend five minutes. All right, so um, recursive types. All right, so the reason we, we want to add recursive types to our language is because we want to be able to. Um, encode things like lists and trees, okay? So something like, um, oh, let's do a tree instead. So you can have a tree type in ML, right? And it could just be, um, Could be empty, or it sorry, could be a leaf, or it could be a node of a tree cross tree cross int. Let's say we're storing integers in the node, right? Um, so if we tried to do that in our simple <coughs> type lambda calculus, what we'd kind of like is to be able to write down uh, definitions like a tree is either nil, um, uh, is, is either a leaf, so let's represent that with the unit type. I'm going to write one for unit types. Everyone okay with unit types? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, or I'm going to use a, a sum type here. Um, so it's either unit for a leaf or it's a node. So it's a tree cross tree cross. So this type clearly, I mean, we're defining a tree in terms of itself, right? Uh, this, is, this is clearly a, a recursive definition. So if it's a recursive definition, it would be what we basically need to do. Well, okay, let's understand the recursive definition for a second. Uh, let's, let me just write alpha for tree so I don't have to write out tree for every single time. So what this definition is saying, basically, is that tree is equivalent to this definition. Um, so unit plus alpha cross alpha cross int. Product type has 
priority, so I will leave out the braces. Um, so this is equivalent to this, right? And it's equivalent to if I basically take this whole equation and substitute it for alpha on this side, right? So we want, for this alpha, we want to be able to substitute unit plus alpha plus alpha plus int times, again, for this alpha, we can again substitute the whole, we would again substitute the whole thing, so unit plus alpha cross alpha cross int cross int on the outside. So basically keep substituting for alpha, right? That's what this definition is, is shorthand for. You, every occurrence of tree here, you basically substitute the whole um, right-hand side for that occurrence of tree again, right? And ultimately the trees that we're interested in, we could, we could take, continue this process in the limit, right? And we get an infinite tree, right? Okay. So what we want is we basically want to take, uh, this is a recursive definition, we want to take a, a least fixed point. Uh, so, so for the tree here, let's try, uh, everyone okay with fixed points? Sort of? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So let's uh, write down the function f of alpha um, whose fixed point we need in order to get a, get a tree. Um, Basically, it should be, well, let's write it like this. Here's a function on types that takes a type alpha, which is my way of saying that alpha is a type, and gives you back the type unit plus alpha cross alpha cross int. Right? And we want to take the least fixed point of that. So in general, um, what we want is, I'm going to write down mu alpha f of alpha for the least fixed point of any function of this form. Okay? So if this is the least fixed point of a function that takes a type alpha, then by definition that means that it is equal to f of mu alpha f of alpha. That's just by definition of what a fixed point is. Whenever you have a fixed point of a function f, it has to be the case that the fixed point is equal to f of uh, itself. Okay? All right. Um, now, let me just write tau here for f of alpha for a second. Mu alpha tau is equal to f of mu alpha tau, but f of this Right, f of alpha, I'm saying, I'm saying let, let tau be equal to f of alpha, right? So this then is really equal to tau with mu alpha tau substituted for alpha. Yeah? So basically, um, what I'm saying is let's posit the existence of a fixed point, all right, at the type level. Uh, and we're going to write it down as mu alpha tau. And by definition of it being a fixed point, we have this, equa this uh, e equation that mu alpha tau is equal to tau of, um, is equal to tau with mu alpha tau replacing alpha. Okay? All right. Now, um, basically, this is a recursive type. What we want to do is extend, uh, so once we have recursive types of this form, how would we write down tree? We can write it down using this simply as mu alpha unit plus alpha cross alpha cross int. So having a mu type, a, a recursive type in our language lets us write down, uh, lets us define things like trees and lists and so on. Okay? All right. Um, now, Here's the little technical bit. I want, I'm going to add recursive type to our simply type lambda calculus up there. So I'm going to add alpha type variables to my type language and I'm going to add recursive types to new alpha tau. Okay. And in particular, the, there, are, there are two flavors um, of recursive types that you can add, um, you know, in which you can have recursive types in your language. Um, so one is iso-recursive types. Iso-recursive types is when this equation, let's just ignore this. Let me write it here for clarity. You can view this equation here as an isomorphism or as an equivalence, 
All right? And that essentially leads to two forms of um, recursive types that you can add to your language. So if you view it as an isomorphism, then that means that you want, that you need some sort of operation in your language to witness that the view is changing. So you have something of this type, and you wish to treat it as something of this type, you need to do something in order to shift the view. And we call that, an, we can call it an unfold operation or an unroll operation. It just unfolds the type, in a sense, for you. All right? Um, and we have a fold operation that goes in the opposite direction. So fold and unfold witness this isomorphism. They allow you to shift views between these two types. Um, there's another way of doing recursive types, which is where you don't treat this equation as um, an isomorphism. Rather, you, uh, you treat it as an equivalence. Therefore, that's called equi-recursive types. Okay, so iso-recursive types and equi-recursive types. Um, we're not going to do equi-recursive types. In equi-recursive types, you don't need the operation. Um, you treat it as an equivalence, and the type system basically has to do inference of, uh, about when you're shifting views. But I won't go there. Okay, so what we're going to do is, is add some operations. We're going to add fold E and unfold E to our language. And... I'm going to erase the evaluation context we have here just so I have more room. Um, okay, so value forms, we are going to add fold V as a value form here. And this will come clear in a second. Um, and so, so notice here, I should make this point before I move on. Fold is an operation that given an expression of type, of the expanded type, tau with mu alpha tau for alpha, gives you back an expression of the type mu alpha tau. And unfold goes in the opposite direction. Okay? So fold expressions will have type mu alpha, alpha, mu alpha tau, and unfold expressions will have the type tau with mu alpha tau for alpha, the expanded type. Okay? Uh, all right. In terms of evaluation context, we have the stuff before, and now we want to evaluate under the fold or the unfold till we get a value. So we have fold E, unfold E. Okay, and in terms of reduction rules, we add the following. When you unfold, so you get this down to a value, right? Sorry, unfold, you get this down to a value. What, what value can be sitting on? Oh, I should show you the typing rule first. Let's go look at the typing rule first. All right, um, so under gamma, fold E has type mu alpha tau. If E has type tau with mu alpha tau for alpha. That's the point I was trying to make over there. Um, and unfold is the converse. Unfold E has type tau with mu alpha tau for alpha. If E has type mu alpha tau. So this expands the type and this sort of contracts the type, rolls it back. Okay, um, so in terms of the operational semantic, the, the only reduction rule we need to add over here is when we have an unfold of a fold V. And that simply steps to B. Okay? the value forms that we've added? Fold V. So fold V has type mu alpha tau. That's um, the form of value that we have, the we have for recursive types. So let's uh, define V of mu alpha tau. What values belong to V of mu alpha tau. Yes. 
Um, all right, so what, uh, what, what kind of values can we put here? Do we want to put here? Six points? Let's, um, what value did I just add? Right? We've been picking values out of this grammar right here. So fold V. Okay. When, is a full, when does a fold V behave like it has type? It has this recursive type thing alpha tau. Let's go look at the typing rules for a hint. If we had a fold V, the underlying V should behave like it has type tau with mu alpha tau for alpha. Yeah? So why don't we just say that? That's basically what we want. We want to say that V behaves like something of type tau with mu alpha tau for alpha. Okay, what's wrong with that? It's ill-founded, right? We are trying to define the interpretation of this type, but inside the definition, we are using uh, the definition for a larger type. Okay, so this is clearly not well-founded. All right, what can we do? 